So thanks for being with us. Uh, despite facing judicial rulings against them, do you think that the recent executive orders have an impact on the safe third country agreement? Do you think that the social implications of the order have a significant impact on how Canada should be regarding the situation south of the border? Well, thank you very much for welcoming me to share some thoughts with you all on uh, on the situation of the global refugee crisis. You know, I think what's going on in the states right now uh, does have an impact on issues to do with the Safe Third Country Agreement between Canada and the United States. But it is important at the same time to understand that that agreement uh, predates the the question of the executive orders in the U.S. Um, you know, it's interesting that the Safe Third Country Agreement has in many ways uh, been one that quote unquote benefits Canada if we understand it to be a benefit that we receive fewer asylum seekers here in Canada. Um, you know, when we think about President Trump and his priorities, it's perhaps surprising to think that this agreement seems like one that will continue. Um, in terms of the, the relationship between the Safe Third Country Agreement and the executive orders, I think the executive orders are part of a broader atmosphere of fear that's being created in the United States that has prompted a lot of migrants, uh, including asylum seekers, to question whether or not the United States is really a place where they can be safe and build a life for themselves and their families. And that's why we have people trying to enter Canada. The way the Safe Third Country Agreement works is that people who, um, who have first arrived in the United States and want to seek asylum, but uh, can't or don't do that in the United States, under this agreement, they can't travel on to Canada and make a claim for asylum at the border. And so this is why they have to travel through the prairies in the dark in the winter. Canada is generally seen internationally as a welcoming place for refugees. How do you think Canada's international reputation on refugee acceptance aligns with its substantive policies on refugees and immigration in practice? I think, you know, comparatively speaking, Canada is a welcoming country and, and has been a leader in terms of uh, both policies around refugee status determination, so refugees who arrive in Canada and want to make uh, an application for asylum here, and then also in terms of the resettlement of refugees uh, from host countries in the global south to Canada. But I think it's important to, to recognize that, you know, who are we comparing ourselves to? In many ways, the bar is very low. I mean, in a certain way, a solo, you could trip over it. Uh, globally speaking, 1% of refugees are resettled. Um, Canada has increased its numbers, but when we think about those increased numbers in relation to need, we're still talking about just a tiny fraction of people. Um, our refugee status determination process uh, has some considerable strengths to it, but because of our geography, the fact of the matter is that very, very few refugees can even make it to Canada in the first place to make a claim for protection here. So, you know, for me, this is really about thinking about the kinds of financial contributions that Canada makes to the humanitarian system. Uh, the United States is is poised to really pull back dramatically on its contributions, for example, to UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. I think countries like Canada are going to have to think very strategically about how do we try to make up for some of those gaps. You know, the other area of Canadian leadership uh, that I see as being really important uh, is around uh, the protection of internally displaced people. So those who are in a situation that is in some ways very comparable to refugees, but they haven't crossed an international border. They've had to flee their homes, but they remain in their countries of origin. These are people who have often very significant needs, uh, but because they are not you know, trying to get on boats and head into Europe, they don't receive much attention. So for a country like Canada, you know, we don't have internally displaced people within our own borders. I think our responsibility is more in terms of trying to support a more consistent and robust response to those countries uh, that do have, have large numbers of so-called IEPs. Uh, what can and should be done to alleviate sort of the imbalance of the burden for refugee resettlement between uh, developed countries like Canada and developing nations like Turkey or Lebanon who are currently overwhelmed by refugee populations that uh, oftentimes there simply is no um, sort of integration framework in place. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a challenging question. The United Nations Refugee <coughs> Agency and uh, the conference that we hosted at McGill uh, this past week, uh, Francois Crepeau, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants, have all called for a dramatic increase in terms of uh, the resettlement spots that uh, Western nations offer towards refugees. Uh, and, you know, evoking experiences during the Cold War, for example, when millions of refugees were resettled uh, to the global north. I think these examples provide uh, you know, important foundation to remind us that this has been done in the past and there's nothing to prevent it from happening again, except for political will, mm -hmm. which, you know, as a scholar of international relations, I think that's a big except. Um, the kinds of, of drivers and political calculations it would need to change in order to ramp us back up to those kinds of resettlement numbers, um, you know, we would need to see shifts. The UNHCR uh, representative who joined us here for the conference also reminded us that, um, in fact, there are many refugees who, who prefer not to resettle. You know, they, they do want to stay in regions of origin where they have family networks, uh, where they speak the language. So I think that we have a responsibility also to support those countries and communities to make um, that act of hosting more viable without the kind of development costs that it incurs at the moment. Do you believe the broad framework of international humanitarian law established post-World War II to prevent refugee crises is still relevant to the present day context? In other words, is the persistence of such crises attributable to a commitment failure on the part of nation states or are there inherent flaws in the international agreements themselves? Well, in terms of international law as it relates to refugee flows, we have international refugee law itself. So, you know, key documents would be the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees. And then we also have the broader range of international human rights and humanitarian law. Those frameworks do provide a really important basis for responding to refugees. But I think it's important to recognize that those kinds of frameworks don't really get to the question of root causes. They provide guidance for states in terms of the responsibilities that they have to refugees who are on their doorsteps in terms of the conduct of war, but they don't address the question of, you know, why do wars the more break out? more frameworks than sort of proactive ones. Mm -hmm, exactly. So, uh, you know, the question of so-called root causes of refugee flows is one that is not in many ways about the law. It's about politics, it's about conflict and political economy. So sometimes I think we expect the law to do more work uh, in terms of responding to refugees than it really can. I think we need to be realistic about the limits of law uh, at the same time as we need to be really firm in calling for the law to be respected. Is a um, institution, an international institution like the United Nations or the EU um, that has been, you know, arguably the, the, the um, delegitimized recently mm -hmm. um, in light of political uh, events in many uh, developed nations both in Europe and North America. Um, are those institutions still in your view the most relevant and the most realistic way to achieve this sort of cooperation on these international humanitarian law frameworks that um, we're seeking to uphold and enforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the United Nations, also the EU, continue to play key roles. You know, the EU, as much as anything, has been driven towards keeping refugees out than, you know, pro promoting a really coherent mm -hmm. response to the crisis. So I think it's important to be frank about that. Uh, you know, the EU does provide considerable humanitarian support for refugees in their region of origin, but, you know, I think that they completely fail in terms of their responsibility towards refugees and asylum seekers who are who are trying to make it into European shores and um, you know who can make valuable contributions to European states. Uh, in terms of the UN, I mean. The UNHCR organizations like the International Organization for Migration (IOM) continue to play a huge role uh, in this in this crisis situation that we find ourselves in. But it's important to recognize, you know, there are also NGOs who have a critical role to play. In many cases, it's actually, you know, small, very local organizations made up of refugees themselves that are playing a critical role. Uh, refugees International, for example, uh, an advocacy organization that focuses on, um, on refugee issues, has recently re released a report that focuses on the organizations that are founded by Syrians themselves, including Syrian refugees, and the pivotal role that they've played in terms of uh, responding to the crisis there.